understand. Now we pray, all glory be to God. In your name, your power at work in us. Feel the heavens shaking. Into all the world we go, into all the world we go. With your love, into every life, your love, so glorious, your love. Into all the world we go. Now we pray and shout your love is here. In your name we throw down everybody and welcome to Thurfield Chapel. My name's Ben, I'm one of the elders here and it's, it's a pleasure to have you here this morning, uh, whether you're here in person or joining us online via Facebook. Uh, we've got a, quite a packed service to fit in today uh, and also, as you know, we are obviously, as you can tell by the flags, celebrating the Jubilee as well uh, and we'll be, as part of that, uh, be having a, uh, a, a picnic, <laughs> a picnic, an indoor picnic of course. Uh, after the service today. It's a shame about the weather, isn't it? But, uh, but even still, it'll be great to have fellowship together and to be able to celebrate the Jubilee in style. Um, to that end as well, thank you very much to those who've decorated the chapel and made it so lovely for this weekend, especially the... I mean, this, this is amazing, isn't it? This crown here. 
Hey, who gets to take that home afterwards? I don't know. We should have some kind of prize or competition. That's very good. So thank you very much for all that. Uh, I've got loads of stuff to tell you about this morning, so bear with me. But uh, we ha- also have our usual things that are on this week, um, uh, t- starting uh, with our prayer meeting tomorrow night uh, here on, uh, on Zoom, uh, and then various home groups and things throughout the week, culminating on Saturday night uh, uh, with a social at our house in Royston. If you'd like to come along to that, you're very welcome. There's a s- sign-up sheet at the back for food, but um, we've got quite a lot of food. If you're coming, please put something on the sheet. I'll turn it over, fill it in. Let's have loads of people and have a great time next Saturday. Yeah. The weather is better. Um, so the things that we have got to give out are some of which are Jubilee related. So I can give you that now. So we've got, um, oh, see, too many things to hold. We've got a couple of these uh, little tracks. One explaining about the, uh, a little bit about the Queen and her faith. One, thank you very much, uh, is a little gospel uh, book as well. And one much thicker book, uh, which again talks about the Queen and her faith and service over 70 years. Uh, they, these are all available on the table at the back as you came in. We were g- intending to have these to kind of give out uh, this afternoon because we were going to be joining in with some celebrations in the village, which have uh, sadly had to kind of, uh, well, <laughs> the weather's going to put page all over anyway, but w- uh, some of it was cancelled anyway. So we, uh, we've got all these books, so please do take one. If you've got someone you think would benefit from them, th- then feel free to, to pass that on. Um, so that's all good. If you want to find out what's going on during the week, uh, the stuff that was on here is all included on an email. Uh, you can sign up on one of those cards. That's all good. Uh, and we have our EFCC in Fellowship magazine. So these are, this is the, uh, the body to which our church is affiliated. Uh, and they do a magazine quarterly. It's a spring, so that I'm going to go with quarterly. Uh, uh, just to update you on all that's going on with the churches within the EFCC. Is that one done? Uh, and then just to encourage you as well, we've got some other things that we were going to be giving out today uh, if we were doing a stall in the village, uh, some leaflets and again more gospel tracts as well. So if you'd like to take any of those with you, please do. Uh, it'd be really good to be thinking about the people that we can uh, invite along to, to church on Sunday or indeed to many of the activities that we have throughout the week which are written on the back. Uh, we are blessed with a, an amazingly beautiful village, but it's not Oxford Street out there and people don't just wander past very often. Uh, so we need to be uh, thinking mindfully about who is we, who is we can maybe invite along uh, and be praying for them uh, and, and handing them stuff that might indeed help encourage them. So that's all of that. There's a big table over there which is very full uh, at the back now, so please help yourself to any of those on the way out. I think that was everything. Um, so... Uh, another piece of news uh, is, as we've been saying for the last couple of weeks, is that we were going to be taking up an offering for the church again. We haven't done this for a few years, but we are reinstating it. Uh, so that's going to take place just shortly. Uh, if you are a visitor or, or, or not regular uh, attendee here at Thurfield Chapel, please let the boxes pass you by when they, when they come around. Uh, uh, there's no requirement on giving at all. Uh, if you'd like to give in other ways, there are other options. So please come and see me or one of the other elders at the end of the service if you want to give more regularly in other ways electronically. That's all fine as well. But that's it, I think, for the giving. What have I forgotten? Nothing. Good. Okay. So, after many years of not being able to say this, could we now take up the offering for the work of the chapel, please? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing. We're going we're gonna to sing together while the boxes go around, and then we'll, we'll pray for the, uh, the gathering afterwards. Here I am. 
Father, we just thank you for these gifts that are given, both the ones that were given just now and those that have been given throughout the week through other means, and of course, those that are given in time and in other ways, Lord, we thank you for the people of this church that give so willingly to you as a part of our worship, Lord, as a part of our worship to you, for you are worthy of it all, and we just thank you that we can come, we can pour out our hearts to you this morning. And we just pray that you'll bless the money that is given for the use and for the work goes on in this place to spread your name, to spread your name, Jesus. Far and wide. Amen. Also today is Pentecost Sunday, for those of you more minded to remember such things. Uh, and so uh, the celebration of <laughs> Pentecost uh, reminds us of the reality that, that we all have in the unifying of the Holy Spirit uh, that was poured upon poured out from that first century church. And as we were reminded last week, uh, the Holy Spirit is given uh, for the common good for us all, that uh, we might exhibit its gifts with love, as we're going to be hearing about today. For these gifts of the Spirit are worthless without love. And so that same Holy Spirit that was promised and given to all believers on that first Pentecost is promised for you and your children and for all who are far off whom the Lord our God will. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. Oh, I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are well be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. 
can compare. You're a living who. become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness holy spirit you are welcome come flood this place fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your On and on and on and on it goes. 
It overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid There's one thing remains Yes, one thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up
I'm just going to have one more song <laughs> today. And it's the Jubilee, obviously. Uh, we're, we're giving thanks for our wonderful Queen, all her years of service and her faith and all those other things. But there is another Jubilee that is going to come one day. And this that we know is going to come to an end and something far, far better is going to replace it. And so this is our real Jubilee, that, that all the pain and suffering and everything is going to end and it's going to be replaced with, with Jesus. And uh, so we're just going to sing this morning a song that reminds us of that and that he is going to return and he is going to come again and that he's alive and he's on the move. Kingdom will come that shall not end Where light owns the dark and hope will win The empires of evil will no longer stand and Tremble defenseless before the great I am The king is alive, he's on the Justice will flee from the flash of his sword. There be no question that Jesus Christ is born. Behold, he comes, the risen one. Salvation is coming. Behold, he comes, the shining sun. Redemption is coming. Shall come our jubilee. Fancy will soar on golden streets. Our pain just a memory. Our tears wiped away. Standing in glory at last, we'll sing his fame. Oh, he goes.
Let's pray. Father God, on this uh, special weekend when we celebrate the, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, Lord, we want to thank you for her. We want to thank you for her heart of service, of putting others before herself. It's not a life that she was expecting when she was a child. Uh, she was perhaps expecting to be a minor royal in the sidelines, but she took on this role and she's served us faithfully for 70 years. Thank you, Lord, for her faith. We just thank you for the opportunity she has in her Christmas uh, messages to talk a bit about her faith. We, we just thank you for, most of all, for her example, for her dedication. And Lord, for, for the way you've blessed us as a land, Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Yes, times are hard for, for, for some now, but uh, when we look across the world, we, we, we're just grateful how you've kept this land in peace, you've kept this land in relative prosperity, um, in freedom, Lord, that we have freedom to meet, freedom to not only to worship you, Lord, but freedom to share the gospel in this land. Um, and uh, Lord, yeah, I pray that you would preserve those freedoms, that you would preserve this, this land, keep us in peace. Lord, we want to pray for those lands that are not in peace. Lord, we continue to pray for Ukraine, Lord, for the great suffering that's in that land, for the many who are who have fled from their homes, from those who are, yeah, those who are fighting, those who are, um, yeah, those who are in great need. Lord, you have compassion. Um, I pray that you would hear their prayers, that you would bring peace and justice on that land, and Lord, for those in other lands, places where people are in great famine at the moment with the rising food prices and poor harvests, Lord. We just think of the Sahel region in West Africa. Please, Lord, have mercy. I pray, I pray that you would bring peace to those lands and that you would provide for needs. Thank you, Lord, that you hear the cry of the hungry. You hear the cry of the destitute, of the refugee. Help us, Lord, too, to be generous, to be open-hearted, open-handed towards those in need. Um, Help us, Lord, to uh, yeah, not to close our ears, Lord, as we as we rest in relative prosperity in this land. I just pray that you would would help us to to be generous. And Lord, today as we also celebrate the the birth of the church, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, we just thank you, thank you, Lord, that uh, even on that day there was a, a hint of the many tribes and nations that will be ultimately there at that that great jubilee we just thank you for the for the different languages and the people from all over the the roman world who were there uh, and heard the praises of the lord in in their own tongues and we just pray that uh, you would help us as your global church to be reaching out to all of those all of those peoples who have yet to hear perhaps those who've lands where the gospel had once prospered but uh, has long been forgotten uh, lands where other religions or ideologies like communism hold sway and people are not able to hear the good news of the lord jesus i pray lord that uh, that you would mobilize your church that you would mobilize every resource that everyone would have the opportunity to hear of the lord jesus and that every tribe every tongue every nation will be present at that ultimate celebration lord we've just been singing about lord keep our eyes fixed on that day and uh, yeah i pray that we will make our decisions day by day looking forward to your return and what will really count we pray in jesus name amen thank you phil um, it's now time for uh, the children to go to their activities. So if you want to follow Claire upstairs, that would be great. You're going to be learning about Nicodemus today. I hope that wasn't one of the questions. Um, if you do, there you go. Sweet, straight away. Um, okay, uh, and we're going to remain. Uh, we're going to hear God's word read to us uh, by John to the second, and uh, Andrew Proudfoot is going to come and speak to us after that. So, John, if you want to come and read to us from God's word, thank you. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in the mirror. Then we, will s then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these, thi these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. All right, thank you, John. I uh, hope you can hear me. I'm not sure if this mic is uh, in the right place. I can't seem to get it adjusted. Can you hear all right? Good. Right, well, my name's Andrew. I'm also one of the elders here at the chapel. It's my privilege to take you through this, uh, this marvellous uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, today. And our passage this morning, of course, is probably best known as a wedding reading. Uh, the chances are that many of us here had it at our wedding, uh, or at least have heard it at a wedding service that we were at. And it certainly tops the list of Bible readings to have at a church wedding service, if you Google that. Uh, either as a complete chapter or just those key descriptive verses, verses 4 to 7, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. And it's great that so many people listen to these words as they enter married life, for the sort of love that Paul eulogizes about here will provide a solid foundation for their life together. But there is a danger that both the happy couple and their guests will misunderstand what Paul is really talking about here. When this passage is juxtaposed with Di Diana Ross and Lionel Richie singing of their endless love at the reception disco. And sadly, for many, the endless love proclaimed at their wedding will come to an end. And despite Paul's confidence in the real world, love often fails the test of time. And so many people are put off Christianity with its message of love, arguing that a God of love would never let this happen. Whether this is their own relationship difficulties or a child suffering from cancer or the atrocities of war or the ravages of famine or whatever tragedy concerns us. And if God is the God of Diana Ross love, then they have a good point. Such syrupy, sweet love is simply overwhelmed when faced with the harshness of life as it really is. There has always been confusion about what love really means. In our times, it is romantic love, which is the main focus of attention, often held on a pedestal as the highest goal in life, while paradoxically and at the same time, being quickly jettisoned if someone can live more true to themselves with a different partner. 20th first century romantic love 
has become about how I feel and not about the good of the one I supposedly love. Love had quite a different connotation in first century Corinth. For a start, the modern concept of two people falling in love and getting married was not how things were done. Marriages were generally arranged by parents with the couple having very little say in it. If they were lucky, love followed marriage. But if not, then it was just an accepted part of life that you lived your life with a partner who was in many respects good for you because your parents maybe chose wisely even if you didn't have the hots for him or her. On the other hand, the erotic attraction between two people could easily be fulfilled outside of marriage, for men at least, with no shame and no comeback. In fact, just as today, the repression of sexual attraction was looked on by most people as a bad and pointless thing. Eros love, as it was called, from which we get that word erotic, was prolific in the art and the culture of the day. But that was far from the whole story. You've probably heard of platonic love, named after Plato, the famous Greek philosopher of the 4th century BC. In our day, this means the sort of aromantic but deep uh, friendship that two people can have for one another, a sort of sexless eros. But that's actually a corruption of what the term originally meant. In Plato's thinking, you see, the world was divided into two realms. This is a bit complex. There was a so-called sensible realm of the physical world where we experience things by sensation. And then there was the intelligible realm, which is hidden but more real for Plato, where we experience by intellect as we think about these things. And the goal of the philosopher or of any sophisticated person was to contemplate this upper intelligible realm. And this was thought to be a kind of spiritual world of patterns or forms which were represented by each object in the material world. There's a lot to get your head around here, but the key point is that Plato made the distinction between what he called vulgar eros, which is the earthly love so worshipped today, whether we would consider it vulgar or not, and divine eros, which is love for the supreme beauty for the, in the intelligible realm, the ultimate form of the good, as he called it, which might be equated with God. And that love could not be fully achieved by mortals who could only seek to ascend further up a ladder of love with each rung moving away from the earthly, earthly uh, concerns and towards the divine. In the context of the early church, the misapprehension about love which they had to deal with was this platonic love, the contemplation of otherworldly perfection. And so the church basically invented a new word to describe godly love in Greek. Agape, you may have heard that before. And that's the word that Paul uses in our passage, and it's used throughout the New Testament. From Matthew chapter 3, this is my beloved son, to Revelation 20, which talks of the city that God loves. It's a great shame that in English we have only one word, as this leads to all sorts of confusion. (coughs) And if confusion about what sort of love we're talking about is one problem with this famous passage, so too is ignorance of its direct context. The things Paul holds up in seeming contrast to love, tongues and prophecy and knowledge, are a rather odd list, which I guess many people will see as examples of potential achievements in life. In 21st century speak, this point becomes nothing you achieve in your life, your education, your career, your good deeds, are worth anything unless you succeed in romantic love. Hmm. Or maybe in first century Corinth it would be taken to mean, even if you are a great rhetorical speaker and know all sorts of things about the intelligible realm, that is nothing if you don't climb to the top of the ladder of love and contemplation of the greatest good. 
Well, fortunately, we've been spending the last few months going through the earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians. And so I think we can see more clearly what Paul is getting at. <clears throat> All these things, tongues, prophecy, and knowledge, were things the Corinthians were proud of having in their church. And yet their church was deeply dysfunctional. Not because these gifts were bad, but because they were practiced without agape love. It was not only dangerous, but deeply ironic that they should be manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit without the primary evidence of his presence in their lives, which should be agape love. If they truly let the Spirit hold sway in their lives, then he would nurture in them the fruit of the Spirit chief amongst which, of course, is agape love. We saw a few weeks ago with the issue of head coverings that some of the women in the Corinthian church thought that, the mo uh, thought that more of the promised blessings of heaven were theirs already than was really the case. And so they kind of eroded the distinction between men and women, thinking that was no longer relevant, which Paul then had to correct. And a similar thing was probably going on when it came to their use of tongues. As it's Pentecost Sunday, it's worth taking a quick diversion to look at what Paul means by the tongues of men and of angels. We'll focus more on that next week, so in some senses it's a shame that we're not a week ahead in our portions. But anyway, pente, from which we get the word Pentecost, is the Greek for 50. Uh, and uh, Pentecost is so called because it's the 50th day, if you count the, the posts and not the panels of the fence, uh, from Easter Sunday. So it's seven weeks. We can read about it in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came in a small gathering of believers and enabled them to speak in other languages so that people from different parts of the world could hear someone speaking in their own language. That would be the tongues of men that Paul referred to. But at some point, the Spirit also enabled people to speak in tongues which no human could understand, which is what Paul means by the tongues of angels. This was the gift that the Corinthians most prized, maybe because it made them seem super spiritual to be praising God along with the angels in angelic languages. And just like with the short-haired women of chapter 11, it seems that some thought that this indicated that they were already living as though they were in heaven. Paul needs to correct them by reminding them that they are not, in fact, in heaven, and no one else can understand what they're saying. So if they were really acting in agape love for others, they wouldn't take time in their services speaking in tongues when it was only of benefit for them. Fortunately for us and for all those weddings where this passage has been read, he chose to do so in a most poetic and powerful way rather than in a rant. <clears throat> if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now it's important to realize that Paul is not setting agape love in competition with the gift of tongues. They are not alternatives with agape love being the better option. Rather, agape love is the foundation on which the rest of the Christian life is built. It's also important to understand the contrast between the agape love of the New Testament and the Platonic divine eros love of Corinthian culture. That love is driven by the beauty and the goodness of the object of love the so-called form of the good, goodness in all its lovely perfection. And to those used to thinking of love in this way, it's only the lovely that should be loved, which is bad news for the majority of us who are unlovely. You can imagine this being the attitude of those in the Corinthian church who, came, uh, who behaved with no regard for the poorer and less lovely members of the church when it came to their fellowship meals, to the eating of meat, or to any other divisive issue? Why should they consider the needs of those that they perceived as being so much further from the form of the good than they were themselves? 
But agape love stands in marked contrast to that. Yes, of course, God is the ultimate good, and loving him is, in that respect, similar to Plato's divine eros. But the nature of God's love, the nature of the good of God himself, is far different from what the Greek philosophers thought. They imagined the good as untainted by the lesser goods and indeed the evils of the physical realm, aloof, unmoved by what happens on earth. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. Paul wrote in, one, in Romans 5, 8. Do you see the distinctive character of God's love here? Whereas Diana Ross' love is too weak to withstand the harsh realities of life on earth and ends in despair, and Platonic divine Eros' love is too quick to ignore the world and ends in disengagement, God's agape love dives right into our sinful world to deal with that sin and ends in our redemption. As the hymn writer says, my song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. This is agape love. And this is to be the mark of our dealings with one another in the church. So if the Corinthians had agape love for the loveless, <clears throat> if their attitude was even faintly the same as God's attitude, they would naturally be seeking the good of their brothers and sisters over their own good. They would happily rather be wronged than, see, uh, than, than take a brother or sister to court. They would rather forgo their right to eat meat than harm the conscience of a weaker brother or sister. They would rather keep silent in church, reserving their gift of tongues for private worship rather than crowd out the service with an unintelligible display of their own spirituality, which might also make others feel inferior about theirs. And this is the heart of the message that Paul had for them in this letter. And I suspect that's why he crafted it with such poetic beauty and rhetorical power unlike that portion in Corinthians 11 that I preached on a few weeks ago. So with that general background in mind, we can approach this familiar passage with fresh eyes and maybe see some of the remarkable details that Paul includes for the Corinthians. Because although I've no doubt God knew that this passage would be used far and wide, Paul is writing to a specific set of people at a specific time here too. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now to our ears, gongs and cymbals are rather harsh and we can imagine that that is Paul's point, that speaking in tongues without love is discordant. I think the King James Version gets a bit closer to the original Greek with its sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. You see, Corinth was a center of excellence in bronze or brass working. And one of its products was a large vase-like bronze vessel which produced a dramatic resonant sound when it was struck. It was actually used as a sound effect in theaters and the likes. And on its own, it meant nothing and wouldn't be worth listening to. It wasn't much of a musical instrument. But as part of, the the of a theater production, it added to the drama and spectacle and actually helped to communicate the action and the emotion of the scene. Symbols similarly were common instruments in ancient music and they're mentioned many times in the Old Testament as part of a praise band. Uh, we don't have them here today, but uh, that, was the, that was the case in days gone by. But on their own, they were simply a noise. But combined with other instruments, they help to convey the sense of worship and meaning in the music. And so Paul's point then is that practicing tongues without love is like striking those bronze resonators or cymbals on their own. That's simply not what they were intended for. 
It doesn't communicate anything to the listeners. It's just an unintelligible noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Paul, as we know, ranks prophecy high on his list list of gifts. And faith is, of course, essential right from the start of the Christian life. So again, Paul is not belittling these things. Yet what he is saying should give us pause for thought. It is possible to have the most complete and powerful faith and the largest portion of the greatest gifts, but not to have agape love and here i think we see the difference between the gifts and the fruit of the spirit the measure to which we receive his gifts and put them to use are no indication of how much the spirit is actually working in our hearts he uses all sorts of people to accomplish his purposes and so in the extreme we can have a great ministry but be nothing if we don't have agape love. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Given what we know of agape love as a love which gives to the unlovely, you might think that giving up all your possessions to the poor would be a sure sign that you had agape love. And of course, Paul is not trying to discourage people from charitable giving. It is a loving thing for people to share their resources with people who are in need, as many are doing in the surrounding countries uh, for the Ukrainian refugees and, and even in the UK. But it is possible to give with the wrong motives, like Ananias and Sapphira did in Acts 5, when they wanted to look good in front of the church. It's not the external signs which are are the fundamental part of agape love, but the internal attitude of the heart, which will then spill over into those external things and not vice versa. And what Paul meant by giving his body over to hardship that he might boast is in a similar vein. You see, boasting for, for Paul was not an inherently negative concept. As he said in Chapter 9, verse 15, he would rather die than be deprived of the boast that he did not charge for preaching the gospel. And in 2 Corinthians 11, he boasts of all that he has suffered for the gospel, which certainly counts as giving his body over to hardship. So what I think he's getting at here is that unless our attitude is right, unless we do it in agape love, then the things that we are most proud of doing for God are worthless. That's one thing you might want to reflect on yourselves or maybe even do in our home groups. What is the activity that you would put here? For example, in my case, if I spend all my free time preparing a sermon on 1 Corinthians 13, but don't do so because I'm motivated by love, then I gain nothing. Paul goes on to paint a picture of the things that agape love does and does not do, all of which are exemplified in God's love for us. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And these most popular of verses can also be misconstrued as a picture of a tolerant and lenient old grandfather who puts up with the bad behavior of his grandchildren just in order to spend time with them. But agape love is not blind to the faults of those who are loved. It may not be easily angered, but it can be angered by persistent rebellion. It may not keep a record of wrongs, but that is far from turning a blind eye to these wrongs. 
To have agape love means to forgive, not to ignore those faults. And so faults will have to be challenged with the motive of nurturing the one at fault. And agape love also means to delight in the truth, both when those grandchildren are honest about what they have done and when they behave in a good way which is consistent with God's truth. The King James Version, again, which uh, we know and is still even used in some weddings, renders verse 7 that love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And that could be, in, could be interpreted as love putting up with any behavior or being gullible in believing everything that someone says. But that's, again, not the sense here. Rather, when faced with someone who is unreliable and rebellious, we are not to give up hope for them, but to persevere in our prayers and in our effort to help. This is agape love. Paul then goes on in verses 8 to 11 to show how agape love is not only necessary for all other virtues to be meaningful, but is the most enduring. Whereas many aspects of this life will be superseded when we get to heaven, this is not the case for agape love. Hence, the gifts that the Spirit gives us for this life may not be relevant in the next. There will be no need for prophecy, which helps us to navigate the uncertain future of life here on earth, such as the examples that Fred gave to prepare for a famine or to avoid persecution in a particular place. Because in heaven, we can be certain that the future is good. The many languages of earth are a sign of division amongst people and will no longer be heard when we get to heaven. When everyone understands and speaks the one heavenly language with no need for interpreters. And the special knowledge of God, which the Corinthians were so keen on, will in heaven be nothing special as everyone will know what God is like from their personal and immediate experience of him. It's not that these things are unimportant or without purpose now, simply that they will be redundant and superseded in heaven, just as childish behavior is actually appropriate for a child, but is left behind when that child grows into an adult. In contrast, agape love is never left behind is never inappropriate, never out of fashion, and will never fail. Hence, it should be our main concern to cultivate that agape love. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror, then we shall see face to face, or as the King James Version again puts it, for now we see through a glass, darkly. Now mirrors in Paul's day were often made of bronze, and guess what? The Corinthian bronze experts were particularly good at making them and particularly proud that the reflections that they gave were clear and undistorted. You see, Paul's point is not to contrast the blurred picture that a poor mirror gives with 2020 vision that we will have later, but to contrast the very nature of looking at a reflection, at something in a mirror, compared with engaging directly with the real thing. It literally reads something like this. For at the present time, we look through a mirror in a riddle, but then face to face. To think of a reflection as a riddle was a common metaphor of the time, partly, I guess, because the image of, is the reverse of the reality, left swap with right, partly as well because not everybody had Corinthian mirrors and they'd be a bit like those distorting mirrors that you get in the fairgrounds. But this contrast of riddle-like and indirect communication with direct face-to-face -face communication is actually reminiscent of the way that God spoke to Moses, as it says in Numbers 12. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. 
But face-to-face -face speaking with God was the exception in Moses' day and still is now. That will be actually the norm in heaven. We might modernize the metaphor to something like, now we join in Zoom meetings, but then we will meet physically. <clears throat> and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> Paul concludes this chapter by adding faith and hope to agape love, which is a pretty common triplet, faith, hope, and love in the New Testament. There's a bit of a controversy over what he means by saying that these three remain now. Some go as far as to say that uh, to use this as justification for cessationism, which is the idea that the charismatic gifts cease shortly after the New Testament period, whereas faith and hope and agape love remain. And part of the difficulty is the assumption that there will be no purpose for faith and hope in heaven, because we will live by sight, not by faith, and we will uh, all have what we have hoped for that will already have come to pass. Although some might argue that we still have faith in God in heaven, we still trust him with our lives, and that life there will not be dull and monotonous, so perhaps there will always be somewhat something to hope for in the sense of looking forward to. Maybe what Paul is getting at is to reinforce the fact that agape love is not in competition with gifts. It's not gifts now and love later, but just as gifts are relevant now, so is agape love. And with agape love, the other key virtues of faith and hope, which flow from an attitude of agape love in the first place. But the main message is clear. The Corinthians and we should not be seeking or using spiritual gifts at the expense of cultivating spiritual fruits, chief of which is agape love. So how do we do that? How do we cultivate those fruits? Well, by letting the Spirit rule in our hearts in place of our own desires. By letting Him set our priorities and our agenda rather than our selfish ambitions. And of course, by looking to Christ, to whom the Spirit always directs us as the perfect example of agape love. This is what Paul calls the most excellent way. Yes, it is relevant for wedding services and for every day in our marriages, but that's not its limit or even its main focus. Agape love impacts all of our relationships with God himself, with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors, within the church, which is Paul's prime focus in this chapter. And demonstrating agape love is also our prime way of reaching out to others with the gospel. As Jesus Christ himself said, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your great agape love that uh, Paul waxed so lyrical about uh, all those centuries ago and that... Uh, is read so frequently in this country and in this world, and we thank you for that. And we thank you for what we've been able to, to learn this morning about just the depth of that love, just how beyond compare that is, how pale our earthly loves are in comparison, how weak and how fleeting. We thank you that your agape love never fails. And we pray that that might be our experience, that each one here would know your love in our hearts, that would know the inspiration that comes from being loved like that, that we might love others in the same way. And we pray that that would be our experience, that we would be, we would be and be seen to be a people that love one another, that agape love one another in all that we do. And that as we do so, that we would be filled with love for those outside, that they would be drawn into your kingdom and drawn to good, give glory to you, our great God, who is agape love.
Thank you, Andrew. Let's uh, close by singing a song that reminds us of exactly that, that uh, the, the love that the faces in our hearts we want to be demonstrating to, to the world around us for the sake of the world.
that does complete our service for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Do hang around for uh, the picnic that's going to follow. If you haven't got any food and you want to stay for the picnic, then I'm not promising loaves and fishes, but I, I will, in agape love, share my pork pie. <laughs> Which, if you know me, says how much I have been transformed by God's agape love. But let's, uh, so do hang around. I'm sure there's more than enough to go around. Uh, but let's just close with this, this short benediction as we close. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. Thank you.